virtual class around about now you're probably asking yourself how will that work well we'll all find out together won't we uh, but basically you know i think we can do this without any problems we can keep the same grading system keep um, the revised schedule that i've now posted on blackboard under co course documents and our next two quizzes, our last two quizzes, five and six, will be online under assignments. <clears throat> and the nice thing about that is that you'll receive your grade instantly. I may or may not be able to continue to give an extra credit question that I have to grade separately. We'll see what sort of time crunch I face in uh, these online course preparations. And the final exam will be online under assignments. It will have the same time limit that you would have at the end class exam, 2.5 hours. Um, however, if you run into internet problems during the exam, you'd need to contact me. Uh, for now, let's say email using the urgent designation, but um, as we get closer, maybe I'll give you my phone number. <clears throat> and of course, I'm going to be posting recorded lectures like this with sound. And I may also post links to short videos that I want you to watch. I'm thinking of setting up perhaps one time a week when we can all meet at the same time using Blackboard Ultra Collaborate. Um, if we do that, I post a time, you log in, and we can all hear each other. Um, but whether or not I do that or how often I do that depends on your answers about internet capabilities. But I was thinking it might especially be a good way to, for us all to connect with each other and to review before the final exam. So I thought I'd ease you into lectures and class by telling you how I spent my spring break. As you all know, I was scheduled to work at the Mulberry site, a Mississippian multiple mound town on the Watery River in central South Carolina, just outside of Camden. I was in the field beginning Saturday, March 7th through Monday, March 16th. That is this past Monday, less than seven days ago, today, Sunday, when I'm recording this, a total of seven, uh, 10 days in the field. And just yesterday and this morning, Sunday, March 22nd, others were working at backfilling our big backhoe trenches into Mound A. We had two major goals. The geoarchaeologist, Sarah Sherwood, wanted to examine two more cross sections through the remnant of Mound A. Here she is sitting with my dog uh, on her right, Coco, the brown dog, and one of her two dogs, Tai Tai, on the other side. I wanted to remove the plow zone in a small trench into what the gradiometer had defined as an extraordinarily large structure. Um, and digging a little trench like this is one way to ground truth the gradiometer reading. When we arrived at the site, it had been raining for weeks. People asked, are we going out? We wondered, should we go out? The river was very high. The field roads were difficult to drive, even with four wheel drive. But by the time we left, it hadn't rained for that 10 days, more or less, and the Watery River amazingly was back to normal by the end of 10 days. <clears throat> Mound A itself is nearly completely gone, washed away by the river. Here, Sarah looks at a section of the bank that had just collapsed as we were at work inside a trench. I don't know if you can see it, but just past that brush in the, in the river, you see kind of the um, bubbling, and uh, brown, that's, that's the dirt that has just fallen in and is kind of still bubbling in the water. I had rented a cat, backhoe dozer, and Andrew, who's in this class, operated it for us. Thank you, Andrew. The truck delivering the machine got stuck on the field road a good half mile away from the site. And Andrew not only had to push the truck with, with the uh, backhoe, but he had to drive the backhoe the rest of the way to the site. And let me tell you, you can walk faster than you can drive one of these. So it was a long drive. <clears throat> so then Andrew, unfortunately, instead of getting to be an archaeologist in the field with the shovel and trowel, got stuck digging the two new backhoe trenches while the geoarchaeologist or her helper supervised. And he began with trench three, which was south of but parallel to uh, the trench that we put in Mound A in 2019. And Trench 3 showed us the far southeastern edge of the mound. Um, complex stratigraphy, very interesting. If you look at the bottom of this photo, you see black. That's a black sheet midden uh, marking the ground surface at about AD 1250. And all of the dirt above it was brought there by humans as they built the mound. Now, this is just the very, very tippy tip 
edge of the mound and the rest of the mound is out in what is now the river. Um, the excavators cleanly cut the profiles to show the strata. There we are using some of your vocabulary, the strata, the layers. Uh, numbered targets were placed, as you see on the right-hand photo, and Sarah took many overlapping photos for photogrammetry. And that's where you take photos and stitch them together to make a very detailed uh, and a comprehensive photograph of the entire thing. Each target was then mapped using a total station, which gives us the exact horizontal and vertical elevation and location of each point of reference. <clears throat> and at the top of the red pole that um, Andrew is holding in place is a prism, which the total station laser targets. So it, it bounces a laser beam off that prism. And here's what it looks like from the other end. I'm here at the total station on the right. In my left hand is the data logger. And in the background, I've put an, a red arrow pointing to the prism target that I am shooting. After that, we trowed the floor. And what we found in the bottom of trench three was 19 post molds. That is places where there had been wooden posts in the ground uh, and then uh, now look like molds. In this particular picture on the right, um, there are 11 post molds. I don't know if I want to try to show them to you. Let's see if I can do this. Here's one. Here's another. Here's another. Whoops, I'm not very good drawer, am I? There's another. But we can't explain what giant posts were doing in a big circle like this. But it could be that they are not all dating to the same time period. So the yellow ones date from one layer and the brownish ones like those two might date to another layer. Here's another one. Here's one that you can see in the, going up the profile. See, it's going up the profile. Here's another one coming down, just the very bottom of it's there. Here's another one in the profile and on the floor. Uh, and then there's another one up here. And I forget if there's another one down here. <clears throat> and while he was troweling the floor, Andrew found a small triangular point, something that would have been on uh, used as an arrowhead. So he was quite pleased with himself. And the second trench that Andrew dug for us was trench four, placed also parallel to the 2019 trench, but it captured the northern edge of the mound remnant. And there you see Sarah's other dog, Finn. Uh, here's Finn. And there's Tai Tai, and my dog is probably hanging around me. And on the west end of it, toward the river, we found some very interesting stratigraphy. Of course, archaeologists always think dirt is interesting. Other people show pictures of kids, we show pictures of dirt. Um, but this is showing some kind of like an embankment here. Uh, and the mound itself went up like that. So what is this embankment and why is it there? And then the mound coming on top of it. So that's very interesting. And at the opposite end on the opposite wall, we had this burnt layer and it's full of daub, which is a burnt house wall fragments and charcoal. And you could see, you could see that surface, what was the surface at the time. So on the last day, this past Monday, I collected dirt from the fill above that and from that burnt layer um, uh, for recovery of the charred plant remains that I examined. And here's what it looked like at the base. So here's, here was the fill above it. And then here's that burnt layer coming down in. And you can see here, after I had taken that out for flotation, we were left with a burnt clay floor. Also very interesting. Um, in the in the uh, fill up above, um, they encountered a whole bunch of sheets of mica, which is uh, something only the very highest elite could use and is very interesting that that big sheets of mica were there. And on the last day, last Monday, Sarah and Anita tried taking magnetic readings. This was a new endeavor from the various strata. So there they are trying to work out does it work or not work. The second objective was to explore the humongous structure that was found by the gradiometer. And here you see the gradiometer map in kind of black and gray and white showing magnetic readings. So when you see a, a reading like this one, that's where there was something large metallic in the ground, something metallic in the ground. 
Um, and then the green uh, little outlines are the, uh, the guy, the expert's interpretation of what the readings show. And he found this giant, giant structure over here. And we're curious about that. So we put a little trench in right about there. And we use shovels to remove the uppermost plow zone, revealing where individual tines of deep subsoil plowing had gone in 1985. So here's one tine went there, one went there, one went there. It looks like it actually has gone this direction and one over there. And um, it struck me as we got down to this, um, where did that black midden and where did the orange burnt earth come from? So here's black midden and right next to it, some orange burnt earth, black midden, orange burnt earth. If you look in the profile, you see an A horizon, very thin, uh, only uh, uh, grown there since they stopped plowing uh, back uh, in the, oh, I don't know, about 1990 or so, 1989. And then uh, the regular plow zone, and then here we are uh, starting about there, where the deep subsoil went deeper it had to have pulled these colors up from down below. So that made us want to go deeper, and we did. And here's what we found. We found what we expected to find, that the entire area should be covered by this black sheet midden that you see here. And instead, we have some places where it's not covered, and you have, in particular, uh, two post molds. There's one, and here's one. Uh, and then you can still see some remnant plow scars. There's one going there. Looks like one going there, one going there, maybe one going there. And a possible historic burial. Kind of uh, looks like it might be in a wooden coffin. So we stopped at this point and uh, guess who got to backfill it? So we hope to explore more here in May and June. But unfortunately, I'm afraid that we won't be allowed to congregate even then. We'll find out. While we were in the field, we worked long hours. Uh, we usually started at 8 in the morning, and more than once we went until 8 at night, which is dark. Um, and sometimes Sarah and Anita started at 7 in the morning, and sunrise was at 7.40. So they started before sunrise, and Sarah and I left after sunset. So in sum, I was exhausted the entire time, and it took me three days to recover. That is, I, I didn't feel like a normal person until this past Thursday. But one of the highlights was that Andrew taught me how to operate the CAT 305, and I, I should put a big smiley after that CAT 305. So I was the one who used the bulldozer end of that to backfill the uh, pit with the plow scars. So the 10 days were tremendously interesting and fun. Every part of my body hurt. I was so sore, I'm so bruised and cut up and I fell in the blackberries more than once, but it was fun. Now, please exit this presentation and watch my other short presentation introducing early woodland by talking about early woodland cavers.